Good afternoon. My name is Lorenz Ravaccia. I'm standing here as a teenovator, proudly representing my school, the British School of Milan. I've always been taught that food is a privilege, an essential resource that should not be wasted. Yet the rate of global food waste has simply augmented throughout the years, reaching a pinnacle point where roughly one third of the food produced in the world for human consumption every year gets lost or wasted. It is thus essential to implement new strategies, such as raising awareness and promoting collaboration between the different value chains in order to fill the gap necessary to achieve zero hunger. While all groups have a part to play in combating food loss and waste, the role of companies that operate in the food value chain is perhaps the most critical. Their role in production through to consumption makes their decisions such as raising awareness and their actions, such as promoting collaboration, both vital in combating world hunger. It is crucial for both of these strategies to be fully undertaken. For the problem, problems we solve today will shape a better future for tomorrow. Thank you very much. One crucial question faces our planet today. Will our resources last forever? Climatic changes are disrupting the natural course of the seasons. The global population is exploding, especially in urban areas. Natural water resources are disappearing, consumed by intensive farming. So how will we feed our entire planet? And how can we be sure it's quality food? It'll need nothing less than a revolution. We need to rewrite the rules of sustainability. Thanks to CLED, we're embracing this revolution and driving it thanks to our expertise. We design and manufacture LED lighting to make plants grow faster and better in greenhouses as well as indoors all year round. We ensure the perfect light spectrum for each type of plant, the best illumination angle and intensity. At Chefla, we're experts in climate control, cogeneration, building automation, technological and auxiliary systems. Today's consumers demand quality foodstuffs. Our health is influenced by what we eat. Our farm city concept enables on-site cultivation of healthy superfoods in a retail environment. We have the right answer to the question our planet is facing today. The only approach which will create value and ensure a sustainable outlook for the generations to come. Design consultancy, innovative products, and industrial expertise. The one-stop partner for a brighter future. Good afternoon, special guests, dear participants. Let me start by congratulating Marco for this game-changing initiative. Seeds and chips, <laughs> he deserves. <laughs> Seeds and chips is a rich ecosystem of new thinking and fresh ideas. From young people to policy makers, entrepreneurs to incubators, academics to investors, we all come from a diverse range of perspectives. Yet, we are all here to shape the future of food. As it has been said this morning, transforming diversity into opportunities. On behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, it is an honor to be here today. Honored guests, Three years ago, the international community committed to a world with no poverty, zero hunger, a healthy planet, and everyone enjoying peace and prosperity by 2030. But we are far from reaching that goals. Today, in this world of plenty, 820 million people still suffer from hunger. This is one in 90 persons. And 2 billion people 
are lacking in micronutrients. As a paradox, we are witnessing a global epidemic of obesity, affecting one out of eight adults. Obesity is hitting rich and poor countries. And you will be surprised. This costs two trillion US dollars, and I repeat, two trillion US dollars a year in health bills. Can you imagine what this would translate into development? Let me pause and say, we really come a long way, but somehow our own progress seems to be our downfall. We learn how to cultivate food, but the abundance is what of what is in our table is slowly killing us. And healthy diets are the world's number one cause of disease, disability, and death. In Africa, 20% of the population is undernourished. In the same household, you will find family members who are undernourished and some obese. This is the double burden of malnutrition. In FAO, we believe that tackling hunger and all forms of malnutrition will catapult our global efforts in achieving SDGs. So, what does this take? We must change how we grow, share, prepare, consume our food, mo moving to more sustainable food and agriculture systems. We need to apply the key word of this summit, innovation. We need to innovate, to spark novel ideas on how we can have a better relationship with food. Tell me tell you the story of Susanna, an organic farm in North Macedonia. She bought for farm management software to better plan and monitor crops, minimize labor costs, and spend less on gas and fertilizer. The result? She's earning more income, her farm is better managed to benefit her family and her community. We also have Barkisa in Burkina Faso, who believes that microbiology is key to making degraded land green again and productive, and carrying out research to prove it. Their stories are just samplings of what innovation can do to transform our food and agriculture systems. And we are, throughout the summit, listen from several innovations coming from all around the world. Our role, you and I, lies at the center of the survival of this planet. It is all about food security. Nutrition hangs on agriculture and biodiversity. Do you know that out of 30,000 edible plants, only four, rice, wheat, maize, and soy, are used for 60% of the world's dietary energy intake? We must diversify our choices, just as Milan has done. Since Expo 2015, it has become more a city of fashion and design, and now a capital for food and healthy eating. Thanks to seeds and ships and the decade of Milan Food Week, we can enjoy the fruits of this amazing makeover. Governments have a responsibility 
to establish rules and standards to promote healthy and nutritious food. The world needs a global pact against obesity that embraces traditional and local foods. As consumers, all of us, adopting global healthy diets would curb the proliferation of poor diets that have seeped into our, our modern lifestyles. As it has been said this morning, change diet, change climate. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now look at our food sources. Globally, one third of our land is degraded. 22% of animal breeds are at risk. Millions of hectares of forest disappear each year. And about a third of marine resources are overfished and this is exacerbated by climate change. Shockingly, about one third of our food is lost or wasted every year. I am sure we all in this room are guilty of wasting food at an one or another time. The only way to meet significant increases in future water, energy, and food needs and to reverse food losses and waste is to shift to more sustainable and consumer produ production. Honored guests, our fruits and vegetables do not just magically appear in markets. It is thanks to family farmers who produce over 80% of the world's food and manage three quarters of the planet's natural resources. They are often poor and food insecure themselves. Recognizing their critical role in feeding the world, FAO will kick off the UN decade of family farming in two weeks. Innovation in agriculture can unlock the potential of family farmers to drive inclusive growth along the entire value chain. Now, take urbanization. Urban food demand already consumes some 70% of national food supplies. And by 2050, two-thirds of us will be living in cities. Rural Urban Alliance creates space for small producers to coexist side by side with larger retailers and help meeting food growing demands. And this is where partnership, the private sector, all together we are responsible to feeding the world in a sustainable way. Rural urban, um, in this regard, agriculture innovation is the limb chain that can radically transform food systems, provide agripreneurship opportunities and jobs for youth and rural women, and boost national economic growth. Tomorrow, FAO will showcase inspiring examples of innovation. I hope you come along. Ladies and gentlemen, agriculture and food nutrition are the foundations of our society and our common responsibility. This amazing group of visionaries here can play a critical role in innovation, in innovating to improve our food environments and build a zero hunger wo world where no one is left behind. It takes just one spark for something big to ignite. On that note, may this summit prove a great spark for you each. Thank you.
this on? Can you hear me? All right. Thank you. I'm Carrie Kennedy. I'm the president of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. I'm so happy to be here today with the great Marco Gualtieri. Let's all give him a round of applause for bringing us together and for your vision, Marco, and for all you've done to make us have a healthier planet and better food. Thank you. I'm also here with my daughter, Michaela Kennedy Cuomo. Stand up, Michaela. And her college roommate, Natalie Barrage, right there. And Gail Everts, who's on the Robert F. Kennedy Leadership Council. Um, I want to talk to you today about, uh, about sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger and human rights. In 2015, as we all know, the nations of the world came together in New York um, and committed to stop poverty and address climate change. And they all agreed to achieving the 17 sustainable development goals. Goal number two is zero hunger. So it's great that all these countries have said we are going to try with all our might to achieve glo um, zero hunger by 2030. But as a human rights organization, we don't think of zero hunger merely as a dream to be achieved. It is, um, we think of this as the law that every single person on this planet has the right to food. And that's not just a concept of a right, it's actually in the law itself. So all the countries, almost every country on earth has signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the covenants on political rights and social, cultural, and economic rights. And those rights, those covenants, give each person the right to food. Those, that right has been recognized across the world and now has become justiciable. Justiciable means that if you're not getting your right, if your right is not being recognized, you can sue somebody. And one of the countries that this has been most successful in I'm happy to report is Italy, here in Italy. Two years ago, there was a court case that was brought to the Court of Secession, which is the largest, the, um, the highest court in Italy. And they overturned a case against um, a man for stealing. He was taking food out of a grocery store. And the Court of Cessation found that he was homeless and he was hungry and he was starving to death. And that his right to food was more important than the right to property. So they overturned his conviction for stealing. That's a very, very important case for all of the world to look at. Today, food insecurity um, touches two billion of the seven billion people on earth. And every night about 850 million people across our world go to bed hungry. That is outrageous because we have enough food on earth to feed every single person nutritionally. So we need to address this issue the number of people who are living in hunger has actually ridden, risen over the last 10 years. And in response to that, the um, Global North has responded by saying, we will provide food aid as the main solution. But food aid too often does more harm than good. And I'd like to give an example of that. In Haiti, um, they, the, there was an attempt to get to zero hunger. And 
Uh, and so Haiti depends on rice. That's their m main form of nutrition. Um, in 2015, in the United States, there was an abundance, a super abundance of rice produced. And so the United States de Department of Agriculture said to all the rice farmers, don't worry, we will purchase your excess rice. So we'll stabilize the prices. Then what was the USDA going to do with all that extra rice? They said, we'll give it to the Haitians. So they brought all that excess American rice and they dumped it in the Haitian rice market. What do you think happened? As a result of that, the American rice was very, very inexpensive and the Haitian rice was expensive. So everybody purchased the American rice. Is this okay? Everybody purchased the American rice and all the Haitian rice farmers went out of business. The following year, there were no Haitian rice farmers left, and the US did not send the rice to Haiti. So there were rice riots across the country that were so extreme that thousands of people died, and it forced the parliament to um, to uh, overturn the prime minister and the prime minister had to resign. The next year, the United States said, the United States companies started sending rice to Haiti. And today, 80% of the rice consumed in Haiti, sold in Haiti, is um, from US corporations. So Haiti went from a country that was completely uh, uh, self-sufficient in the production of rice in 1985 to, 80 to using 80% imports from the US today. And that costs Haitians $200 million a year. So that can be the unintended consequences of food aid or someone said the intended consequences of food aid. Um, getting to zero hunger will also require changes in the food industry itself. In 2016, the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award was presented to the Associated Press for an incredible series of stories that they wrote over an 18th month period looking at the fishing and shrimp industry, particularly in Southeast Asia, concentrated in Thailand. The $2 billion shrimp industry was exposed as um, having child labor, forced labor, sexual assault, trafficking in persons, and extensive use of slavery, particularly with um, with migrants from Myanmar and Cambodia. As a result of that, consumers sued Nestle, Mars, and Proc Procter and & Gamble for the failure to disclose the use of forced labor in their pet supply chain. And um, President Obama passed legislation tying um, trade, uh, trade to um, to freedom in supply chains, and the EU issued a yellow card which threatened to ban seafood imports from Thailand. In response to all of that pressure, started by consumers, in response to the journalists, the Thai shrimp industry formed the Shrimp Sustainable Supply Chain Task Force, which represents 80% of that $2 billion industry, promising to address the labor and human rights issues. <laughs> to do so will require going beyond simply putting together a code of conduct. The um, Shrimp Sustainable Supply Chain Task Force will also have to address migration issues, engage local labor NGOs, and increase transparency of funding 
of the task force itself. The third and last example that I would like to relay today is um, the example of a rights-based approach to zero hunger is the coalition of Immokalee workers in South Florida. Two decades ago, Southeast Florida was known in the United States to federal prosecutors as ground zero for modern slavery. Then, a group of tomato pickers known as the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, or CIW, came together and created a plan to combat the abuse. Over the past two decades, they have worked with the Department of Justice and successfully prosecuted eight cases of slavery in the United States and freed over 1,500 slaves in my country picking tomatoes. The CIW realized that grocery chains and fast food giants were leveraging volume purchases to demand ever lower prices from growers. This, in turn, translated into downward pressure on wages and working conditions for farm workers. So in 2001, the CIW joined consumers, mostly young people, like the people who are on stage earlier today, on 150 college campuses. They demanded that buyers like McDonald's and Taco Bell, who profited from degraded working conditions at the bottom of their supply chains, agree to only buy tomatoes from growers who comply with the CIW's Fair Food Program. The Fair Food Program now represents 90% of Florida tomato production. And under the Fair Food Program, workers created and participating growers have agreed to seven conditions. One, a penny per pound wage increase, which is the, fir the farm worker's first wage increase in three decades. Two, compliance with human rights-based code of conduct, including zero tolerance for forced labor, child labor, and sexual assault. Three, worker-to-worker -worker education sessions conducted by the CIW on the farms and on company time to ensure workers understand their rights and responsibility. Four, a worker-triggered complaint resolution mechanism leading to complaint investigation, corrective action, and if necessary, suspension of a farm's participating grower status and thereby its ability to sell to participating buyers. Five, health and safety committees on every farm to give workers a structured voice in the shape of their environment. Six, specific and concrete changes to improve workers' wages and working conditions, including the provision of shade in the fields and the use of time clocks to record and count all compensable hours accurately. And seven, finally, ongoing auditing of the farms by the Fair Food Standards Council to ensure compliance with each element of the program. This is an extraordinary, first-of-its-kind type of, of initiative, and it's a win-win-win agreement. The buyers achieve transparency and risk prevention. Instead of waking up to headlines of slavery in tomato fields, they now see best work environment in U.S. agriculture. Workers continue to participate actively precisely because they have seen the worst practices and actors weeded out the virtual elimination of wage theft, forced labor, violence, sexual assault, and significant increases in compensation for their labor, including $26 million in premiums, and vast improvements in their work environment, including increased sanitation and safety. And finally, the growers have become employers of choice with less turnover and safer workplaces as well as purchasing preferences and a wage supplement for their workers. The worker-driven social responsibility model has served as the basis for the Bangladesh Fire and Safety Accords and now the newly launched Milk with Dignity program dairy workers are using in the Northeast United States. The program is poised for expansion to other states and workers in the construction, janitorial, and poultry industries are studying adaptation of the model to their sectors 
where there are also identifiable brands or entities at the top of those supply chains. And in response to the Me Too movement, the Motion Picture Academy, which awards Hollywood's best talent at the Academy's awards, is now consulting with CIW in order to bring a worker-driven code of conduct and monitoring mechanism to the movie industry. This is a scalable, replicable model for virtually any industry which has a supply chain. Zero hunger is a laudable goal, but reaching that goal will require a rights-based approach. Italy has set a great example of a rights-based approach to action. We can learn from the experience in, in Haiti, Thailand, and the tomato fields of Florida. In closing, I would like to quote Anne Frank. She said, hunger is not a problem. It is an obscenity. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Thank you so much to Marco Gualtieri and Seeds and Chips. We know the way forward. Let's not wait a single moment more. Thank you very much. That was great, Carrie. I, your quote at the end was beautiful, and it made me think of a quote that I'm sure you know very well by Norman Borlaug, who's a Nobel Peace Prize winner, farmer, researcher, who said that food is the moral right of all who was born into this world. I'd also like to thank Marco and the entire Siege and Ship team because putting on something like this is not an easy feat and they've made it bigger and better every year. Thanks for inviting me again. So my name is Kimberly Flowers and I'm the director of global food security at a bipartisan foreign policy think tank in Washington, D.C. with a very long name. It's called the Center for Strategic and International Studies or CSIS. So what do I do? Um, I follow global food security trends and I think about the impact that U.S. leadership and foreign aid programs have on agriculture development and nutrition. I travel around the world, I talk to smallholder farmers so that I can better understand what kinds of interventions work best. In Washington, D.C., I convene thought leaders and decision makers as we think through policy solutions to some of these complex issues. I also write a lot, analytical publications that connect these large global food security issues to U.S. strategic interests. Ultimately, my job, or the aim of my work, is to sustain American political will to reduce hunger, poverty, and malnutrition in the developing world. Here at Seize the Chips, that's only day one, right? And I'm sure you've already been inspired by the young entrepreneurs, learning from food innovators, and connecting with leaders who are passionate about transforming the global food system. It's this fresh energy, these new ideas, that's essential to our work because we have a really important and very difficult job to do if we are going to achieve the sustainable development goals. So before I start talking about dark stuff like war and famine and malnutrition, I want to focus for a minute on the positive. So these global goals, I love that the boxes are right behind me, these global goals can really push political leaders, international donors, and the private sector to achieve great development progress. So before the SDGs, there were the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals helped to lift one billion people out of extreme poverty. They also enabled more girls to attend school than ever before. And in fact, that target of reducing the number of half the people, oh, sorry, I said that wrong, the target of reducing by half the number of people living on $1.25 a day was actually met five years ahead of that, 200, or that 2015 deadline. These are huge accomplishments. They deserve recognition, they deserve praise. In addition to these successes, the proportion of undernourished people in the developing world today has fallen quite a bit. It used to be 23% in 1990, now it's 13%, or it was 13% in 2014. But even though the number of hungry people as a whole has gone down since three decades ago, we are not at all on track to reach zero hunger. As Maria mentioned in the beginning, about 11% of the world's population, 815, 120 million people, go to bed hungry every night. Of that group, 
113 across about 50 countries experience acute hunger, which means that they require urgent humanitarian relief. And here's where it gets really stark. There are three countries facing potential famine condition, conditions in 2019. Yemen, South Sudan, and Northeast Nigeria. I do a lot of talks to um, young students, and I always like to ask them which countries they think have the worst food insecurities. And it's really interesting. They usually know Yemen, but they're usually, Northeast Nigeria is usually not even on their radar. In Yemen, which is the world's worst humanitarian crisis right now, the United Nations estimates that 80% of the population, or 24 million, requires some form of humanitarian or protection assistance. Let that sink in a minute. 80% of a country's population. So after a decade of really consistent progress of seeing the number of hungry people go down, this trend has now reversed the last three years. The number of people hungry in this world today has been rising. So really, our progress is going backwards. So why? Why are we losing ground? Why are we losing hope in this, uh, in this ability to achieve zero hunger? Well, I'll tell you, the primary culprit is conflict, though climate change and climate volatility is right behind it. So it's man-made conflict, not woman-made conflict, that is the main driver of the world's worst cases of hunger. Two-thirds of those who are facing hunger today live in countries affected by conflict or insecurity. And until there is peace and stability, I just don't believe it's possible to meet the sustainable development goals of eradicating poverty and hunger. To me, to reach zero hunger means zero war. That's a really tall order, particularly in today's context. And even though the overall number of state and interstate conflicts, it's decreased in the last five years, the hard fact is that the severity and the length of the existing conflicts we have today continues to rise. Protracted conflicts today last twice as long as they did in 1990. And in addition to them lasting longer, they also have become more violent. And this conflict is, is also responsible for the surge in the number of displaced persons we have today, which is the highest in history. Another highest in history statistic I can throw at you is how much international donors are spending to respond to these crises. So despite countries dedicating more dollars than ever before, in fact, it was about over 15 billion just to UN appeals last year, the gap between the needs of the most vulnerable and the funding response is also the largest shortfall we've ever seen. There's over 130 million people who will depend on humanitarian aid and protection this year. So how does food insecurity, political stability, and conflict impede or even derail the progress towards SDGs? And is ending hunger and eradicating poverty realistic? when conflict and political instability are such a common threat. Personally, and sadly, I'm really not a negative person, I don't believe they're realistic. The highly ambitious and interdependent global goals embodied in the SDGs are at odds with the realities of today. The SDGs underestimate the difficulties of helping more than a billion people who live in fragile states in order for them to regain the path of equitable economic growth and to reconstruct a torn social fabric within 15 short years. Now this doesn't mean that I don't think universal goals are important, they're really important. And I, I really also believe that we can significantly move the dial and reverse trends. I just don't think we can absolutely abolish poverty and hunger across the globe. We, we actually know a lot of the tools to do this. We know how to improve nutrition, we know how to promote sustainable agriculture, and as long as we continue to have a high level of political will towards these areas of development, there will be sustainable and positive impact among vulnerable populations. So let me, let me unpack that a little bit. So political will, good governance, combined with effective like regulations, they have to be part of the equation. Because good governance, can, it can stimulate agricultural commerce as surely as poor or weak governance can undermine it. So these global promises that we have, 
that are part of the Sustainable Development Goals, they, they won't be possible without sound leadership at the national and especially the local level. Because when governments are actually dedicated and to investing in inclusive agriculture growth and enforcing policies to foster private investments, they create that space for entrepreneurs to thrive. There's a lot of great technology innovations out there. You walk around the exhibition hall and wow, it's really impressive. But I have to tell you, none of those innovations have value and they aren't sustainable if they aren't coupled with strong political will and commitments at the country level to scale them up, at least not to, to reach the, at the uh, most vulnerable populations. So we need this leadership, but we also need private sector to create what we call, in my world, the enabling environment, which just means the rules and regulations that sort of can make and break those entrepreneurs' business plans. Because we want these great innovations to be scaled up in, in emerging markets and to target the right, the right audience or clients. I, you know, when I think about entrepreneurs, which is always what I think about when I come here because I meet so many of them, I, I think entrepreneurs have an opportunity, opportunity, and I would even say an obligation to jumpstart economic growth, to create jobs, to strengthen the food market system, and startups and investors can really help address the food security needs of communities and nations by creating these cool technologies that can address food waste, like our teen entrepreneurs started off with, water scarcity, soil, soil quality, traceability, among other choke points. And I'm, what's really interesting, we had someone on my team just write a, a piece about this, is that investments in food innovations have tripled in the last five years. That's huge. And despite their ingenuity and commendable focus on things like sustainability and food loss, I feel like entrepreneurs are missing this huge opportunity to contribute to the sustainable development goals by not prioritizing nutrition. I saw on the schedule there's like a whole other panel or a whole other session on nutrition next, which is where I'll be going and I hope others will go as well. Because malnutrition, even though it's not the key driver in terms of food insecurity, it's the serious underlining effect. And we really are not going to read the SDGs unless we address malnutrition. There was a report in 2017 called the Global Nutrition Report. And it, it, the whole report talks about this multiplier effect and the catalyst effect that nutrition has. And it says that in order for us to achieve any of the SDGs, we have to be focusing on nutrition. I'm not going to go into all the statistics that I had written on here around malnutrition. You've heard them already. You're going to hear them more. You know them. They're bad. Um, I think what a lot of people don't quite realize, and Maria brought this up at the beginning, is around overweight, overweight and obesity rates and how just horrific that they are rising. And the other thing I want to just mention about malnutrition is that every single country is facing issues in this. No country is immune because they're either dealing with undernourishment, obesity, or micronutrient deficiency. And it's super costly. Maria brought that up as well. But overall, beyond the $2 trillion that she was talking about for non-communicable diseases in that healthy diet, which is so important, worldwide malnutrition costs about $3.5 trillion. And I'll say that it's great that the United States International Donors has focused a lot more on agriculture development, particularly the last decade, and on nutrition and how to integrate the two. But the private sector has a really critical role here to play in terms to fuel, to sustain, and to solve these significant threats to food security. But they have to focus more on nutrition. So these food innovations that you see out there that when you talk to people, they need to better integrate and think about nutrition and the quality of nutrition into their products. The world needs more than the plant-based burgers. Anybody try those Impossible Burgers? I love them. So good. Nobody's going to raise your hands? Okay, there's a few. Great, thank you. <laughs> Impossible Burgers, great, right? But we need more than that. We have to think about not just plant-based burgers, but actual nutrition. And we also need to think about how we could scale that up, not the, not the Impossible Burgers, but how we can create other innovative food products with a nutrition-forward priority in order to scale them up and adopt them within specific at-need global populations. Because when you think about these food innovations, they're not going to succeed alone or all by themselves. Social entrepreneurship cannot succeed in a silo. You have to have the creative minds of innovators, the change-making power of policymakers, and the scientific rigor of researchers in order to really transform the food system and to collaborate together on solutions. I mean, the challenges are immense. They're pretty overwhelming. I spend my day reading and thinking about this. It can be quite a bit. <laughs> 
instability and conflict, climate volatility, urbanization, which Maria mentioned as well, rising food demand, it all has a major impact on these big numbers that we throw out, like global hunger and malnutrition and poverty. And even in times when the conflict and the violence feels so per pervasive, there are solutions out there. Like, we, we really actually know what to do. I'll just leave you with um, two thoughts on what I think are solutions we should be focusing on. The first one is around peace. The first one is to ramp up civilian pressure and political power to foster peace and stability. I'll say what I said before, to achieve zero hunger, we need zero war. As long as there are conflict, as long as there is conflict, there will be hunger and poverty. And the commitments made at the World Humanitarian Summit back in 2016, one of them was to focus on the humanitarian development peace nexus. That needs to be remembered, it needs to be heightened. The second solution I wanna leave you with is focus more on nutrition. I, I can't say that enough. In the US, we spend 0.001% of our budget on global nutrition. Our goal has to be about nourishing, not just feeding the growing population, and nutrition needs to be a priority of food innovators, policymakers, and development experts alike. So if we're gonna make progress for these SDGs, we have to make some pretty radical transformations. We need new ideas by innovative disruptors like the people who are here, but we also need political solutions for peace so that we can create sustainable an equitable food system for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Landis, and I'm the Director of Nutrition at the UN World Food Program. I'm based here in Rome, Italy. Today, normally, I work on treatment and prevention of nutrition around the world particularly in some of the places that Kimberly was just talking about, places with conflict. But today, I'd like to talk to you about Peru. When you think of Peru, you don't necessarily think of food insecurity. I'm hoping these slides will work. There we go. You don't think of food insecurity. You don't think of food, hidden hunger, or micronutrient deficiencies. What do you think about? You think about a country where food is the national pride. This is a country where chefs are rock stars. I'm told that chefs in Peru are more famous than football players. And it, it, they have a, an extreme national pride about food. They also have many, many Michelin star restaurants and chefs. But it might surprise you that also in Peru, there is a serious state of malnutrition. As Kimberly pointed out, they have a lot of stunting. This is where you're often too short for your age. But they've done a tremendous amount of work over the past 10 years and they've actually been able to cut the stunting rate tremendously. They also have a, uh, are on the brink of an overweight and obesity crisis. But what I wanted to focus on today was anemia. Anemia affects about 43% of children under three. It's very, very serious. And for those of you that might not know too much about uh, anemia. It's about not producing enough red blood cells, but what it really means is that you're so tired that you can't play or you can't work or study if you're a, a, a child or a student. And it particularly affects women who are overweight uh, um, or pregnant and lactating. And it's really a national crisis that the government of Peru is really committed to working on. And what they've been trying to do is to bring all of the partners working with the government at the forefront to really address this crisis of anemia. So you've got the treatment solution. You can give kids iron pills, you can give them injections if they're really young. 
but what do you do to create a sustainable solution to make sure the kids are prevented from getting becoming anemic and that they have a good quality diet throughout their lives? Well, you need to change the diet. You need to change what they consume. Do you know what you eat in order to improve anemia? You eat things like liver and gizzards, meat and green leafy vegetables. I don't know about you, but how many children like liver and green leafy vegetables? Not my daughter. It's very, very difficult to get people to add these to the diet. Now, sometimes it can be because they're not available, but they're available throughout Peru. And sometimes it's because these sorts of foods aren't accessible. Maybe they cost too much or they're not convenient. Or it could be because people don't have the knowledge that these are the types of foods that they need to eat. But even when you have the knowledge, often people don't do what they know they should do and what they should eat. Come on, even you and I know what makes up a good diet, but it doesn't necessarily mean we eat it every day. So what is the solution? What is the innovation? Well, in Peru, they came up, I'm always having trouble changing these, where do I point? With a TV show, Cucina con Calza. It's a reality TV show that started in 2017, and it brought together communities. It's focused on communities. It's a very broad country. So they looked at how local communities could come together, what local communities could produce in terms of recipes, and then how they could improve those recipes using celebrity chefs to make those foods uh, very, very tasty even for your most difficult child and adults, quite frankly. How do we make meats and vegetables cool for kids? Well, I'd like to just show you uh, a little bit about what happened. What we created with working, uh, WFP working with the government of Peru, but also working with the private sector, working with nonprofit organizations, local community specialists. We created some community kitchens, particularly for uh, poverty-stricken children, to come in every day and get a healthy meal that would also help their anemia rates. And the women that run these kitchens we call the Iron Women of Peru because they get up very early and they produce things that are so tasty that you wouldn't believe it. Let me just give you an example. When I was there on my last trip, I was eating what I thought was a chocolate muffin. It turned out to be something with chicken blood in it. And chicken blood, is when uh, properly uh, consumed, can be very tasty, but it can, is a kind of iron that you can absorb very well into the bloodstream. So it has a really positive effect on anemia. But in order to make something like that tasty, you need some uh, special recipes and some special chefs. Let me show you what we found. Okay, there was a two minute video here. <laughs> Maybe it'll reappear. pensando en trabajar directamente con pescados azules y diseñar una hamburguesa pero que sea la hamburguesa la hamburguesa visualmente atractiva con esas vísceras y la sangre del cordero yo les puedo enseñar a rellenar unas tripas y hacer como unas salchichas de, de, de sangre de cordero unas barritas energéticas de granola eh, con kiwi, quinoa, pas, maní también estaba muy rico y súper fácil para que incluso los mismos chicos lo puedan sí. hacer
as you can see, <laughs> Peruvians are like Italians. They love their food, and they love, and when they're not eating a meal, they're talking about their last meal or they're preparing for their next meal. So the idea was to take this real innovation, this, this idea that food is, is part of what their national culture and their natural pride uh, is about and connect it with how can we solve malnutrition in our country for our children. This TV show started in 2017, and in its first season, it was seen by four million people. And now in its third season, it goes around the world, uh, around the country, I hope around the world at some point, around the country, picking up foods from various different parts of the country and building local menus and local recipes. It's won three uh, national prizes and international prizes, and we really see it as a local solution for a local problem. Sometimes, though, that you find that not everyone in Peru has a TV. So we've also had to innovate to think about how could we use local communities and create a radio show, or even for urban communities in Lima, how could we use Instagram or other forms of social media to really get at younger children and adolescents to make sure they're also focused on their diet. This innovation works for Peru, but now we're trying to take it global. The next country will probably be Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, we are going to do a, a, a food uh, cooking contest. But we're not going to use uh, local chefs. We're going to use grandmothers. And why grandmothers? Because everyone feels that their grandmother is the best chef they know but also because we want to challenge the grandmothers that have such a large impact about what families eat to make sure that they have all the knowledge they need to make healthy diets. As well, I think it would be pretty fun to see grandmothers in a, in a real cook-off uh, in Sri Lanka. The idea is that we take a concept that's very simple, something that fits with a natural culture and natural and a national pride and see how we can change it to make sure um, that we're fitting with the local culture but still create that innovation. Malnutrition, as was said already today, affects almost every country around the world. And so the challenge for us is how to improve those local diets. And the idea is to find the innovation that works in each country. And for that, we've done everything from digitalization to cooking shows, you name it, as long as it works with the national culture and the national government strategy for how they want to improve diets in their country. So I guess I would just ask you today to join us in helping to think of the innovations that are going to solve malnutrition around the world. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me here. I'm here to give the private sector perspective on uh, SDG number two. I am going to hopefully advance this. Same problem. Where do I point? So. This is, um, I'm with Aero Farms, and Aero Farms is a vertical farming company based in Newark, New Jersey, outside of New York City. Uh, you can see our commercial farm in here. It's the size of a football field. And vertical farming means that we grow vertically, without soil, without sun. We're pesticide free. We use 95% less water than in the field, and we're up to 390 times more efficient than in the field. We also uh, have been doing this for a very long time. Aerofarm started in 2004 with patented technology and expertise from Ed Harward. We've been growing under LED lights since 2009, which is the longest for a vertical farming company. And in 2011, Ed joined forces with David Rosenberg and Mark Oshima to really scale Aerofarm so that it can fundamentally transform the food system. Am I advancing these or are you advancing these? Terrific. 
okay, at Aero Farms, all of us show up every day with a mission in mind. Our mission is to grow the best plants possible for the better betterment of humanity. And by best plants, what we mean is a lot of different things. Today, we grow leafy greens commercially. We're also doing R&D on other plants that I'll be able to talk about in a few minutes. A lot of it's confidential, but some of it I can share with you. And tomorrow, it's going to be another, another plant, uh, probably a plant that somebody in this room or in this conference is interested in doing, co collaborating together on R&D. So because we've been doing this for a long time, we have been recognized in this space. We're a two times global uh, clean tech 100 company winner, which is rare for companies. We've also been recognized twice by Fast Company as one of the most innovative companies in the world in two different categories. And our CEO is part of the World Economic Forum's Global Task Force on Circular Economy. So we really spend a lot of time at AeroFarms thinking about the role that private sector has to play solving today's largest challenges. And this is a snapshot of the SDGs that we actually touch through our business model. And number 17 partnership is also part of this, and I'll be talking about that throughout. When we think about farming, we think about the communities that we're going to affect. Can we go forward? And we think about the, where we put site, site our farms in order to really locate them in areas that are in need for economic development. What you can see here is actually the groundbreaking of our site in Newark, New Jersey. Newark has a long history in industry, and our, we started off um, as a city with a strong industrial, uh, uh, a strong industry, and then over the years that waned, and we're really trying to help bring industry back by repurposing buildings. You can see the before and after picture here. Before, this was a rundown steel mill, and now it is a USDA, so US Department of Agriculture approved commercial farm. And we also create jobs in the community. When you think about food insecurity, you also need to think about food literacy. Uh, and we think about that in terms of educating communities. So could we advance that slide, please? So we have a school in Newark where we actually have one of our farms. It's a smaller farm, which you'll be able to see once we move forward. And in that farm in the back, what you can see is the leafy greens there. And the kids there actually are growing and harvesting the greens and then eating them um, as part of their lunch. So they're really learning where food comes from because a really surprising number of kids don't actually know where food comes from. For example, in the UK, one in three kids doesn't know that an egg comes from a chicken. So we really want kids to understand where food comes from. When President, Iraq, uh, President Obama was in office, the First Lady Michelle Obama came and visited the school. She worked on a platform around kids and healthy eating, and she was able to sit down and eat our greens along with the kids. We also think about creating access to food. Food deserts is a concept um, that is really still prevalent in the United States and in other develop, uh, developed countries where you don't have access within a certain number of miles to healthy, fresh food. So by being in Newark, which is a food desert, we're helping address that. But we also think about that globally. We think about how to redefine agriculture around the world. We, because we grow indoors, uh, because it can be hailing outside, it can be a drought outside, we can be anything you want outside, and we can still grow 365 days a year, we can put our farms around the world. We can put them in true deserts, we can put them in the tundra, so we can bring food to people who need healthy and delicious food. So how do we do all of this? Well, we actually are focused on six uh, areas of the expertise. And those areas of expertise, when put together, allow us to do several things at once. Um, so if you look at the top, we have me the mechanical design, plant biology, and plant genetics. And what I like about those three is it really helps us show that what is inherent in plants as traits um, is just waiting for somebody to help let it out. So what we do is we're able to actually stress plants uh, using light in a certain way, certain colors, certain frequencies, um, certain rates that it goes and change the day cycle to really stress plants. So we can make a plant leaf actually change color. We can make something sweeter. We can make it uh, pepperier. And we can certainly make it full of more antioxidants or micronutrients. So a lot of what we do is actually in partnership with others. And that's an important part, I think, of how we're going to ultimately be really addressing uh, SDG number two. And one example I can give you 
is the partnership that we have with FAR. FAR is a quasi-governmental arm of the United States Department of Agriculture. They awarded Aero Farms a million dollars to really do research and development on the quality of leafy greens. And the quality has everything to do from taste and flavor, because if it's not flavorful, people aren't going to eat it, as well as shelf life, but it also works on nutrition. And I'll give you an example here of, of what we've been able to do with our greens. The idea that we can control this environment was so exciting to the executive director of uh, FAR that she actually coined a new term called precision plants. Um, and what I like about that idea of precision plants is that it really lets us actually kind of, as I said, ex have the plant express what's naturally in there. So if you look, think about nutrition, and I'm glad Kimberly brought that up, because it's important that innovation have nutrition at the forefront of what it's doing. And what we've done is we, with our partnership through FAR, we work with Cornell University and we work with Rutgers University. Uh, and Rutgers has a tasting panel and they taste and rate our greens. And what you can see is just looking at our arugula alone, when you compare uh, our vitamin A and vitamin C to the arugula, uh, that is a recommended amount of vitamin A and vitamin C by the US Department of Agriculture, we're significantly beyond that. Um, and that's important because when you think about what people need as they eat, uh, there was a mention that there are four crops that are really basically the staple for the majority of people around the world, is that we focus on a lot on specialty crops. And so we, by looking at this, we have vitamin A, which is important for uh, eye health and for immune system function. And it's one of the micronutrients that is actually um, missing in a lot of people's diets. There's two billion people around the world that don't have enough micronutrients. So if you look at how what we can do with greens, we can really enhance that nutrition and get it out to people who need it. Building on the success of our research and development in this area, we are now part of an even larger, more global consortium. And that consortium um, is really a public-private partnership with the idea that we're going to really provide flavorful and nutritious crops for indoor agriculture. Most of the germplasm that is out there is actually designed to be grown outdoors. Um, and while we are we're currently growing with germplasm that is from uh, designed from outdoors and we can do amazing things, indoor agriculture is growing and it's becoming a more important part of how we're going to feed this world. And so partnering with different organizations and companies to understand how we can actually create um, germplasm from the beginning that's appropriate for indoor agriculture can only en further enhance what we're already able to do. So we are working, and this is where I can, can be, uh, share a little bit beyond leafy greens. One of the focuses of this consortium is leafy greens, but also herbs, tomatoes, blueberries, and strawberries. And some of the partners in this group that's still coming together um, there is about 12 of us, but a few names that you might recognize are BASF and Sakata and Mitsubishi. So we're very pleased to be part of that. Another thing that we think about when we think about uh, feeding people around the world and, and the idea of hunger is that we have lost a lot of biodiversity, and some other panelists have mentioned that already. You know, we've got monoculture, we've got runoff from agric traditional agriculture that is killing off wildlife. Um, we are not planting as many crops as we used to. And at Aero Farms, we think about how we contribute to that, partly in the way that we grow, because we grow with 95% less water, because we are recirculating that water, because we don't have pesticides, we're not contributing to that reduction of biodiversity, which is very important in the first place. We also don't have soil, so we're not degrading the soil. But another thing is in terms of what are those crops and how do we expand the amount number of crops that people have available to them. So we've actually grown more than 700 varieties of plants. Uh, and so we are look and partner with, with organizations and companies to think about how do we widen the amount of crops that are available to people. How do we bring back heirloom varieties or how do we put crops in the middle of a desert where very little grows um, so they can have access to, to more things and really enhance the biodiversity. So ultimately, Aero Farms does this, as I've said, through partnership, and we're very pleased to be here at Seeds and Chips and able to talk to companies and organizations who are as committed to partnership as we are. And this, if this last slide will load, you can see that we think about the entire world, despite the fact that we're based in Newark, New Jersey. And our partners are from around the world, and what we do with them is we figure out where ultimately are their 
regions of concerns um, and their crops of concerns and their technology of concerns and how can Aero Farms partner with them to ultimately produce nutritious and flavorful food. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege for me to join you here today. Uh, first of all, uh, before the starting of my presentation, I'd like to express my deepest sympathy to the people living in the regions hit by the earthquake. Furthermore, I'd like to thank that Italy is sending Japan words of encouragement and providing our country with aid. All Japanese speakers and delegates really appreciate your considerations, supports, and thoughtfulness after the Great East Japan earthquake. As introduced on the screen, uh, I'm Mitsuru. Uh, Mitsuru is more, I'm running at bio venture company called Ugrena Corporation Limited. Uh, Ugrena Corporation Limited is the uh, startup uh, venture company from the University of Tokyo. And uh, we have succeeded in outdoor mass culture of Ugrena for the first time in the world. I believe that it's possible to solve the malnutrition problems and energy issues with social impacts by a technical innovation, which we are aiming at. Today, I'd like to tell you how we believe to achieve SDGs with Ugrina. As a start, one question we should ask ourselves is, why don't we eat seaweed in our everyday life? Why don't we eat more algae? Scientists claim that seaweed and algae promote a greater longevity of Japanese people compared to Western people. My focus is to cultivate useful algae. Seaweed and algae can do photosynthesis and produce a broader wide range of nutrients, uh, vitamins, amino acids, and dietary fiber. My company has a very unique technology to cultivate algae in factories. But you might have a negative image of eating algae. There are many misconceptions about algae. So let me give you a brief definition of what algae is. Before this presentation, I went outside to the downtown areas of San Diego, San Francisco, New York, London, and Milan to ask the same question. What comes to your mind when you hear the word seaweed and algae? Everyone we asked had a positive image associated with the word seaweed, like ocean, healthy, and important. On the other hand, some people might have a negative idea with the word algae. They associated with dirty swimming pools or stagnant water. In fact, algae is a very simple plant which grows in or near water without stems or leaves. It's a kind of seaweed if it lives in the ocean. I work with over 100 types of algae and some kinds are very useful for human beings. When we cultivate algae in a sanitized environment, the algae is then fit for consumption. Now, let me explain a little about my background and what my company does. I was born in a very normal family, nothing special. Like I have one brother, my father is a corporate employee and mother stays at home. I thought I was going to be just like my father, a corporate employee, but Bangladesh and Professor Muhammad Yunus was my turning point. I went to Bangladesh for an internship program which was organized by Grameen Bank, uh, which was the largest NGO in Bangladesh. 
uh, it was about uh, 20 years ago uh, when Bangladesh was still regarded as one of the poorest countries in Asia and I was only 18 years old, a uh, first year of the University of Tokyo. It was very shocking experience for me. The reality of poverty and malnutrition issue in Bangladesh was something that I had never seen in my life before. There was a lot of food in Bangladesh, varieties of beans, curry, and many kind of carbohydrate food mainly. The children, people in Bangladesh, can eat a large amount of rice curry, but it's extremely difficult to access necessary nutrients such as vitamins derived from fresh vegetables, beef, eggs, and milk due to the lack of electricity needed to keep these items fresh. When I first heard the word of poverty, I imaged starvation. I couldn't even think that there would be a problem that there was food, but people could have malnutrition program. When I back to Japan, I decided to focus my study on nutrition and attempt to solve the malnutrition problems. Finally, I came to know Ugrena, which were uh, microalgae and rich in nutrients. So now I'll tell you about what Ugrena is. Ugrena is only 0.1 millimeter microorganism. What makes Ugrena unique is that Ugrena can photosynthesize, but it can also move by itself. As you know, that a tree photosynthesizes, but it doesn't move around. Ugrena is a plant and animal. This is not something that you see in your everyday life. Because Ugrena is a plant and animal both characteristics. Therefore, it contains 59 types of nutrients, like vitamins in fruits, proteins in meat, they are contained in Ugrena one time. It's not too much to say that theoretically, Ugrena has sufficient nutrients for human beings to live. Since 1980s, many research about Ugrena have been done, but Ugrena is rich in nutrients. Therefore, in nature, many planktons and bacteria love to eat Ugrena. It's extremely difficult to cultivate Ugrena on a commercial scale in a clean environment. And this is why Ugrena research has been done in a clean, protected white laboratory in many universities with this method. Only a small amount of Ugrena could be cultivated, so that Ugrena was very expensive. It was not possible to let people have Ugrena in Bangladesh. Only if I could discover the method and the technology to success mass culture of Ugrena outdoor, I thought that it would be possible to lower the price. If the price becomes lower, it could be supplied as daily food. I went to all over Japan to see every professor who researched Ugrena, and eventually I invented a uh, special cultivation liquid that can prevent from biological contamination and keep cultivation environment clean. 2005, I set up the company, Ugrena Corporation, and uh, after, uh, after that, we did IPO 2012, uh, in the Tokyo Stock Exchange Emerging Market, the Marzas. And only after two years, 2014, uh, we have been upgraded to the first section of Tokyo Stock Exchange. And uh, finally, market cap has reached one billion US dollar. As I said, the greater longevity of Japanese people compared to Western people could be caused by eating much algae. I'd like to show you a set of data. 
First of all, I gather over 100 types of algae in the ocean and from many rivers. Some of the harvested algae produces 50 times more vitamin C than kale, contains 50 times more DHA than sardine small fish, and 50 times more zinc than clams when eaten in the same amount. Second, typically plants are protected by hard cell walls made of cellulose that we can't use or digest. Eugrena has no cell wall and it's able to be digested easily. This means that only 0.2 ounces of Eugrena has more benefits than half of a pound of kale, small fish, and clams. Third, eating algae is a more eco-friendly way than harvesting such a large amount of kale, fish, or even clams. We are facing several big issues such as malnutrition problem, global warming, and water shortage. I believe that algae can play an important role in solving these big issues because of its effectiveness. We can provide required nutrients in highly effective way in developing countries. We have a plan to bring the benefit to Bangladesh. Of course, my experiences in Bangladesh have allowed me to see the need to solve malnutrition problems in developing countries. Therefore, my company has already uh, taken small steps. The company has set up a branch in Dhaka and Cox's Bazaar, very close to the Rohingya refugee camp, and has started to provide algae school lunch cookies to 10,000 malnourished children every day who wouldn't have a lunch otherwise. Because of the shortage of electricity at the schools, they are not able to keep vegetables meat or milk fresh. Algae has a lot of nutrients and it can have 50 times more specific nutrients when take in the same amount. People in Bangladesh don't have to harvest 50 times the amount of kale, they don't have to feed fish, and they don't have to gather shellfish compared to Eugrina. Not only does algae cut the cost of producing nutrition, but the amount of carbon dioxide emission from sipping is reduced. Instead of sipping a huge amount of food with low nutrition, we can now sip a much larger amount of algae with many more nutrients. It's an eco-friendly way, and we can kill three birds with one stone. I intend to solve malnutrition problem, global warming, and water shortage problem. Our goal is to set up a new algae factory in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we would produce algae and at the same time produce jobs. We would be able to hire people at that factory to cultivate algae, store the algae, and distribute it to school children. This project would create many jobs. My mentor, Professor Muhammad Yunus, the Bangladeshi economist who invented microcredit, founded Grameen Bank, and earned a Nobel laureate in uh, 2006 uh, for his work, said in his latest book, he declares it's time to admit the achieving three zeros, zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero carbon emissions. This year, February, we have signed with WFP, announced that my company made tie-up with WFP, funded, uh, affiliated two million US dollar by WFP for providing Ugrena fortified special cookie or food in Rohingya refugees camps for achieving zero poverty, zero employment, and zero carbon emissions, achieving SDGs 1, 2, and 13. 
I have a strong confidence to realize three zero society and eventually achieve the SDGs by using UGRENA in the near future by partnership uh, and technological innovation. Uh, if Japan and uh, Italy uh, construct the uh, great relationship uh, in terms of the research and development and uh, startup network uh, that enhance the open innovation, Japan and Italy can contribute to the world. I believe that this conference Seeds and Chips becomes the first step. And to wrap up, uh, this is the work my company does with RG Ugrina. What I spoke with you about was our background, the importance and evidence for the effectiveness of using RG Ugrina. Your valuable attention and investment in my company would be rewarded not only financially, but economically and ethically. Thank you for your attention. Hello, good morning everyone. My name, or good afternoon even. My name is Ayrton Cable and I'm one of the team of Aters and the founder of Wafa Youth. So getting to zero hunger. So actually it's great we've been able to talk about this in the first place as 40 to 50 years ago it would have been completely unheard of to even suggest getting to zero hunger. However, now with our current technological skills, logistical abilities, and ability to finance projects like these, we're now more in reach of being able to achieve this goal than we ever have in our past. However, that's not to say we're anywhere near achieving it, as one in eight people still go to bed hungry every day, despite there being more than enough food to feed everyone. So, whilst going to this, so how do we actually achieve the goal of getting to zero hunger whilst reducing the amount of negative side effects leaving behind? This truth is, in any sort of technological field, including the food tech industry, uh, there are always going to be some sort of side effects left behind to certain magnitudes or certain extents. And as previously mentioned, the food tech industry is no exception. We still have eutrophication, around the world in lakes and rivers, a famous example being the dead zone in the mouth of the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico, and another one being the harmful effects of factory farming, which affects 60 billion animals every single year. So again, how do we reach the goal of getting to zero hunger whilst leaving the least amount of negative side effects as possible? So that's why I founded uh, part of the reason why I founded Wrath for Youth, and also with the idea of empowering an entire generation of young people to make a difference. Because people tend to think of young people as the future generation, but why can't they be part of the now generation and be a key difference of making change now while they're still young? Let's get the slides work, hopefully. There we go. So Rafa Youth also has these five key values of heart, which are used as much as, uh, which are used in judging participants of the Rafa Youth program itself as much as in you know, the technical skills of the participants themselves. The first one is integrity. Now integrity is generally associated in the Western world with honesty, which it is, however integrity is also a lot more than that. Integrity is also about committing to do no harm. A example of this is the uh, Hippocratic Oath that a doctor takes to first do no harm. Second one. The next one is commitment. Now getting to zero hunger is no easy feat. And there are gonna be many barriers and many hurdles in the way of us achieving that goal. So it's important to remain focused on the goal and not to give up. A famous example of this is how we managed to completely eradicate smallpox just a few decades ago. But with the collaboration of NGOs, governmental organizations, and pharmaceutical companies, we managed to mass distribute vaccines until the health, World Health Organization declared it completely eradicated in 1980. The next one is awareness. Now, there are two sides to this. Firstly, you have external awareness, which is being able to assess the projects that you're working on 
and to truly be able to tell whether what you're doing is actually making a progress or if it isn't what needs changing in order to take a step forward. And the second one is internal awareness, which is being able to see whether your intentions are wholesome or actually whether your intentions are being driven by ego or for the sole purpose of money. The next one is responsibility, which would hopefully come up on the slide. There we go. Responsibility, again, which has two parts. An empowering way to think about responsibility is to see that your cause in the is to see that your cause in your actions. In this context, to see that your cause in reaching zero hunger. And the last but not least, you have empathy. Empathy is taught very well to primary school age children, which is seeing with the eyes of another, hearing with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. And so a general principle of being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and to really be able to recreate your experiences internally. And if you put all these words together, you get the acronym ICARE, which it makes integrity, commitment, awareness, responsibility, and empathy. So far, Rafagu, the water food and air you board, has had over 100,000 participants from over 1,000 different schools. And so far, it's mainly been focused on water security, as you can't solve food security without first solving water security. However, this year we're looking to include food security as well very much into the mix. We're also looking to increase the age range from under 18s to include under 30s as well, as under 30s are still very much included as young people. And so far it's mainly been focused in 12 countries, mainly European countries, um, due to partnership. However, we're also looking to expand to include developing countries as well to increase the reach of the programme. Right. Thank you. Great. Um, I think I'm uh, getting to the uh, end of the series here. Uh, very glad to be uh, invited to uh, Season Chips, and thank you again for the organizers for the invite. Thank you for the clicker. And I should point to the guy on the left there, right? That him, right there. Yeah, so we, got, we solved the clicker problem. Um, so, my name is Kamal Chida, and I lead a, a new program within the Gates Foundation as part of the nutrition um, initiative of the Gates Foundation to basically focus on how to partner with the private sector to help solve malnutrition and, and how to do that. So, this started about two years ago, blank piece of paper with that mission. We need to bring the private sector to the table. And uh, at a high level, the, the intent behind the program is to figure out what are the barriers today that prevent the private sector from significantly providing an impact in, in helping solve malnutrition and going after those barriers. So basically, it's a learning journey that we are embarking on to understand what are the means, capabilities, tools that need to be brought forth to help the private sector be a full partner with the other multi-stakeholders that are already working, doing great work in, in helping uh, uh, alleviate malnutrition. So the way to think of, it, of us is we are basically a business team within the uh, nutrition program of the Gates Foundation and we spend our days thinking about you know, what is the role of the private sector and how to get them to do more. And what I want to do today is really talk to you at a high level of how the think we think of the problem, what are some of the key barriers, and we're going to cover three that we work on, that we have identified as being fundamental to enable the private sector at large to go after malnutrition in a multi-sectorial um, effort. And we heard that term from almost all the speakers that came before me, you know, to solve malnutrition and zero hunger, not one company or not one organization, not one government can do it on their own. So this notion of multi-sectorial, multi-partnership approach is really critical. With that, I'm going to start with giving you a high level how we think about the problem. Can you please play the video? On 
Almost a quarter of the world's children suffer from malnutrition. It can begin as early as pregnancy and is largely irreversible by the time a child turns two. Malnutrition cuts bodies, minds, and futures short. It hurts communities and countries. Food fills, but does not feed. Hunger remains hidden. And yet, their moms and dads spend over $1 trillion a year on food and beverages. Doesn't sound right, does it? The world needs to see a transformation of the food industry. If nutritious products were affordable and accessible, every trip to the local store would help families to nourish their futures. We're looking for pioneering partners, both local and global, to join a new collective. Brave partners to lead the movement in their markets. Innovative partners to create change in the food industry. Influential partners to inspire a nation so that everyone has the chance to grow tall, think big, and reach for the stars. Great, thank you. So that's the way we, we look at the problem, right? We absolutely believe in the, uh, in, in the need for a multi-sectorial approach to solve zero hunger and malnutrition, especially my, with a focus on malnutrition and the role of the private sector there. Uh, and I heard the word uh, revolution is needed. That's absolutely how we think about the problem. And we think of it across the whole uh, food system and the whole value chain within the food system. And what are the key barriers in that, in that value chain that the private sector can influence and that we could help influence to, uh, to achieve the goals. And I just want to make sure that we, we are very, very clear about the way we look at the problem, right? We are absolutely focused on affordable nutrition, right? We, we, yes, solving malnutrition is important, but we absolutely need to keep them in mind the reality of the lower income consumers and affordability is key. We don't talk enough about affordability. I didn't hear the word affordability today. We are absolutely focused on affordable nutrition and we are basically, like I said, a business team that is focused on figuring out how to deliver affordable nutrition to lower income consumers. And there's a, there's a yellow sticker on this thing, so it was my fault, actually. And we cannot see that. Yeah, we can see it. It's great. So, 1.2. You heard it in the video. Lower-income consumers, these are our estimates, right? As a great foundation, we did the math. We think we're almost there. Lower-income consumers in low-middle-income countries today spend over a trillion dollars in the market. They spend over a trillion dollars getting food from the market, feeding their families. But as we heard, they are spending that food on products they can buy, right, of the market, which means that on products that are affordable. The issue is, is that what they're buying today is not providing the nutrition needed. It's filling their stomachs, the, stomach of the stomachs of their children. So these, these people are are filled, they have this, their stomachs are filled, but they're not fed. Filled, but not fed, right? And we heard this before from the previous speakers about you know, the, the four crops, the four major crops around the world that provide the caloric intent, but don't provide the nutrition. And the dilemma becomes such that these people, these populations in these countries, they think they're doing the right thing with their families. Imagine, put yourself in the shoes of a family or a, a, a mother, a low-income mother or a father that goes out to work every day to provide their family. They think they're doing the best they can to feed their families and their children. And they don't know anything about nutrition. They might have heard of it, but, but they really don't know enough. So the challenge that we're trying to solve as a Gates Foundation is to figure out how do we make nutritious food affordable, which is a very tough <laughs> endeavor, but we absolutely believe that in a partnership approach, in a cross-sectorial approach, we can absolutely tackle it. To drive the point around affordable nutrition, I need to absolutely focus, laser beam focus on affordable nutrition. The next number is 44. I'm going to let you guess. If you are, you, you've heard the term diet diversity, right? We need to be talking about diet diversity. Diet diversity is really important to alleviate malnutrition, to address the risk of obesity, and we need to be talking about diet diversity of these populations so that they can you know, provide their families the, the right foods and the right variety of foods and diversity of foods. But diet diversity is not free. If you're a low, lower income family, 
you have a very finite budget. Your budget is not flexible. You and I can go out and buy more fruit and vegetables when we hear about diversity. These families can't. And to drive that point home, if you are a, a daily laborer in Nigeria, and based on your income, you will fall in the fourth income, income quintile in Nigeria, and you hear about feeding your kids eggs, the price of one egg in Nigeria is 44% of a daily wage income earner. 44%. How is, that, how is this person supposed to feed their family? I mean, that's the reality of these populations. So making sure that we are absolutely anchored in the reality of these consumers is really key because otherwise we're not going to be able to identify the right solutions and the right products and services that can help them address their problem. The last number on this slide, sorry, to, oh, please don't move because every time you move I can point. There, sorry, move too fast. 25, again, staying on the topic of affordability, I'm trying to give you examples to really anchor this idea of affordable nutrition that we absolutely keep that in mind, keep that as our laser beam focus if we're serious about tackling malnutrition for lower income populations. In India, if you're a mother that has children at home and you want to give them milk and you do not want to buy loose milk, in India there's a lot of loose milk that's sold on the streets, a lot of time that milk is adulterated. They add water to it and you don't know what quality water is being added to it and you know you might get your kids sick actually. So you want to buy packaged milk, which is safe and also fortified in India. The smallest packaged milk in India is half a liter. Half a liter of packaged fortified milk is 25 rupees. Hence the number 25. If you don't have 25 rupees that morning to feed your kids, you're out of luck. Your kids go to school without milk, even though they put milk in tea to feed the children. So the affordability of nutrition is really fundamental. And getting to know the reality of these consumers is really fundamental in, in, in driving the behavior change that's needed for them to become more aware of what nutrition is. Going back to the $1.2 trillion market, that's a huge opportunity for the private sector. If that is not an opportunity, I don't know what, the, what is. Because the, the food they're eating today is not fulfilling their nutritional needs, or not enough of it for sure. So how do we figure out, and this is what we spend a lot of time uh, as a foundation and within this program talking about this, and I'm running out of time here, but uh, I'll, I'll go faster. Trying to understand these, the needs of these consumers, because the, the private sector that we talk to, you, you'd be surprised, the number of CEOs and, and you know, executives of large and medium-sized companies that really don't know these consumers. The, co the companies don't know these consumers. Some because they don't care, but you know, they, they care about their consumers that they, they sell products to, the, you know, the affluent populations even in low-income countries, but not the low-income. So we spend a lot of time trying to know these consumers and figure out how to create the pull market. How do we get them to care about nutrition so that there's a market for that? We heard the term innovation. This, is, this whole conference and this whole summit here is about innovation and transformative innovation. Even when you talk about innovation in the food, in the food business, I mean, there's amazing innovations out there. The food world, the food business, is full of great innovations that just come up all the time. But you'd be surprised. How often have you heard about innovation in the food industry for affordable nutrition? Never. So we, what we did, we basically last year we set up a, a, a conference and a convening, bringing you know, uh, unusual suspects together from food and non-food, from AI, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, and you name it. We brought everybody together to think specifically about affordable nutrition, and how do we unlock opportunities, and what could be some opportunities for the industry to go after to be able to create affordable nutrition. And if you have not seen it, we came out with this report called Good Food is Good Business, that is available online, that basically points the industry to some opportunity areas that can truly unlock affordable nutrition around you know, uh, uh, forgotten grains that could be brought, brought back, artificial intelligence, distributed manufacturing, cellular agriculture was, is absolutely in there too. And the last, uh, sorry, let me move here, I just covered this one, yep. And the last area that we um, focus on is business models innovation. But before going there, I want to give you an example around innovation that we're very interested in and we are work, working very diligently towards is the 
um, idea of increasing the nutrient density of foods that these low income consumers get and, and solving the protein deficiency that is very prevalent in these countries and these markets and with these populations. They can afford meat and animal protein. So plant-based protein is, is a key enabler to address malnutrition. And we have spent quite a bit of time landscaping, I want to say almost every, close to, uh, plant-based proteins out there that fulfill very specific criteria. There has to be absolutely good quality protein. Not all plant-based proteins can fulfill all the amino acid needs of a human being. So absolutely the highest quality protein that has the potential to go to scale. And the reason for that is because we're interested in affordable nutrition. We need a lower cost protein. Imagine a future where a plant-based protein can be as cheap as sugar. Just imagine that for a second. Nothing will stop companies, the private sector, from including plant-based protein and protein in the food that these consumers eat. And it becomes more accessible and uh, improve the nutrition of, of, of people. So we're absolutely focused on that when we're looking at to set up a, a, a consortia around this idea to see how can we go after the three proteins that we identified as fulfilling the criteria I mentioned. Going back to the business model innovation, at the end of the day, we are a business team within the foundation, like I said, the foundation nutrition program, and we absolutely look at novel business models to allow for affordable nutrition. It's one thing to ask a company, to ask a CEO of a company, to, to lower the margins or the profitability of their products so that the product becomes affordable. They might be able to do it for six months. For That's not sustainable. Our goal is to achieve sustainable impact at scale. Sustainable as in profitable and sustainable that delivers real impact to human beings and populations addressing the two billion people that are suffering from malnutrition at scale. And you cannot do that without sustainable business. So we spend a lot of time t talking and thinking about what are the financial metrics of the future? What are the financial models and the business models that allow companies to do the right thing and still be profitable and sustainable? Our hope for the future, like I said, is that a world where the private sector can play a significant role in alleviating malnutrition that the populations, the women and children that we care about, we should all care about, that suffer from malnutrition, can improve their lives. And in doing that, business thrives. That's the only way that we, can get, we will get there. Thank you.